wanted to start off by, um, you know, hearing the, the distinctions between the economic collapse of 2008 and what our economy has experienced uh, as a result of coronavirus and the uh, shutdowns uh, or lockdowns that happened um, in, in various countries. Um, are there differences and, and how do you, um, you know, suss out those? Uh, how do you suss them out? It, it is a huge problem. I mean, I think it's a problem because what we've just experienced is, I would argue, unique in our experience to date as modern capitalist economies. We've never lived in a th through anything quite like it. 2008, in some ways, was a classic crisis. It was, you might argue, the last great crisis of the North Atlantic financial system that had its origins in the triangular trade and the development of colonial capitalism in the 17th and 18th century and extended all the way through the 20th century, World War I, World War II, and down to 2008. It was about Europe and the United States, over leveraged banks, a cycle based on real estate, and that imploding. Whereas 2008 has some of the same elements, people suffer unemployment on a gigantic scale, not just in the North, but in the global South. We see an implosion of trade, more rapid if you just look at the macroeconomic numbers than something we saw after 1929. In March 2020, and the book focuses on this because it's so much a neglected element of the story, we saw financial markets in turmoil, reminiscent of 2008. And in fact, if you benchmark the collapse in share values, equity values, it's as bad as in 1929. But the difference, of course, is that the causation is fundamentally different. So what I try and do in this book is describe, if you like, the way in which the old familiars, the tensions within global geopolitics, within capitalist democracy, within the financial system on the one hand, intersect with this new shock, the, the, shock of, the shock of the pandemic. And the temptation, of course, is to place the pandemic somehow outside of history as though it was some sort of exogenous surprise. But of course, that's also very unhelpful and frankly misleading because Scientists have been, in fact, telling us for half a century, for as long as they've been warning about climate change and more generally about the environmental crisis, they've been warning about this particular risk of emerging infectious diseases stripping across the, the world economy, traveled through, traveling through the channels of globalization. And yet now, finally, as Mike Davis puts it in one of his brilliant analyses, that monster has arrived, that monster is at our door. And that is, in a sense, what this book tries to describe and anatomize is this global intersection of familiar crisis dynamics and this new long prophesied, long foretold, but now pressing and still with us, of course, if you look around the globe, the pandemic is no means over. It's a the, the past tense, which I use in the title is in a sense, an artistic license. You need to somehow confine this. This book is about a 12 month period between January 2020 and January 2021, but obviously that we all know that the pandemic, especially in the middle, low income, middle, uh, middle income world is still rife. Now, you, you talk a lot about the um, the decisions that elites make uh, in, in the wake of a crisis. And it's the it kind of gives you clues as to the structures of global power. Mm -hmm. um, how have elites responded to the pandemic? Uh, how are they doing and who's really in charge here? No, I, was, I wish we knew. I think, I mean, my own diagnosis always tends towards the disaggregation. I, rather than seeing, as it were, a spider in a web pulling the strings, my own view is that we suffer on the whole from a sort of disaggregation of power, diffusion of power. So what's remarkably striking, and this is obviously one of the huge dynamics of work in America today, is that certain channels of crisis fighting are well-oiled, well-greased. They operate at extraordinary speed and with gigantic force. And they mobilize the entire balance sheet of the American state, the single most significant, as it were, means of financial stabilization in the world economy. So I'm talking about central banks and the actions to stabilize financial markets from March 2020 onwards, whereas other mechanisms just don't function at all. For instance, America doesn't have a national unemployment insurance system. Uh, you were talking earlier on about the political economy of competition. Um, we have an utterly ramshackle uh, process for the development of life-saving and essential vaccines. And even now that we've developed them, we have no mechanism for securing their distribution, effective distribution around the world, even though the IMF of all authorities has estimated that the net payout in terms of GDP growth would be $8 trillion 
for a $50 billion investment. And yet those processes of, as it were, resource mobilization to counter the actual health crisis globally and stop the virus from constantly mutating in body after body, those simply don't function. It's as though huge opportunities for collective gain are just lying on the street. It's as though you're basically being offered a winning lottery ticket. You know it's a winning lottery ticket for a million dollars and you say, I don't actually have the dollar to buy it with. It's an absurd kind of failure of coordination. You know, you you talk about the central banks and um, I love the topic and I wish that there was um, honestly more investigation into it because I, I remember early on in the pandemic when the economy had collapsed, you know, you would hear people like Donald Trump, for instance, he was president at the time, saying that we're going to experience a so-called V-shaped recovery, right? Mm -hmm. This This notion that the economy is going to recover and everyone who's been hurt as a result of uh, coronavirus financially will see uh, their situation improve very soon. But instead, what I think this economic collapse does share with the 2008 economic collapse was that it widened uh, the gap between the rich and the poor. Uh, it continued. It actually accelerated inequality. And I feel that the uh, central bank, certainly the uh, Federal Re uh, Reserve in the United States has helped to exacerbate that and accelerate that. Can you talk about that a little bit and this um, idea of providing liquidity to banks and corporations and, and how uh, damaging that's been? So, yes, I mean, we've gone through the alphabet looking for other letters to label this recovery with. And I think K-shaped is the one that most people have come down on as the best description because the K has, you know, the two, the two parts of the letter go in opposite directions. And what's really amazing is that this polarization has happened despite the fact that the federal government in the United States is engaged in an unprecedented level of spending on, on, on welfare. They've printed checks and sent them to American families as never before. Of course, that doesn't address the structural problems of inequality, of bargaining power, of disadvantage, of racialized hierarchy, of criminalization and so on. But it certainly did. In fact, if you take the, just the poverty measure, which isn't a terribly good measure of social power, but if you take that simple measure, poverty actually fell in 2020 in the first half, despite the rise in unemployment. So we discovered that if you just hand out money, it does in fact alleviate poverty in that trivial sense. The rise in inequality comes from the surging benefits provided to those at the top. So the top 10% and really the top 1% of affluence in the United States, people with large portfolios, um, holdings of the S&P 500, basically of the share index. And, and why this happens is that the extremely blunt instrument of monetary policy is used. And the way it works is that the Federal Reserve intervenes to buy the safest assets out of the market. So the particular market they intervened in this time in 2020 with gigantic effect was the treasury market, the, the, the market for government debt, which is the anchor, as people like Daniela Gabor, the great critical macro finance theorists have shown us, is the anchor the, of, of private financial speculation is a portfolio of government public debt. And that market was in turmoil. So the Fed steps in, it's buying as much to, speak to this liquidity point, it's turning treasuries into dollars, cash dollars, at the rate of a million dollars a second in the last week of March. It's buying over $70 billion of treasuries a day for several weeks. It buys 5% of a $20 trillion market in a matter of weeks. So we've never seen anything like this. This is on a scale much larger than in 2008. And the effect of that, the intended effect, is to shuffle money out of the market the Fed is in, where things are getting more expensive because the Fed is buying them, and into higher risk types of investment, in other words, shares. So the means through which economic policy operates is basically indirectly boosts the equity market, which helps corporations to refinance themselves by issuing capital, but also helps, of course, all of the invested class, that top 10, really top 1% of Americans who actually own a share of this market. And so after cratering in, in late March, the Wall Street has boomed in an extraordinary way all the way down to the present day. So the affluent upper middle class and the elite who have big 401ks and other types of investment come out of this recession unimaginably better off than they were right. before it. Yeah, yeah. Such a great point. Um, you know, just a quick follow up to that. It's more a point than a question. But, you know, when there were debates in Congress regarding uh, the COVID relief that would be provided to ordinary people, 
Um, there was a lot of nickel and diming taking place, a lot of discussion about means testing. But in terms of monetary policy, in terms of the actions of the Federal Reserve, uh, there was no debate about that. Uh, yeah. the, so I mean, so fire yeah. Host. yeah. They, they can and, just unilaterally make the decision to, um, you know, do yeah. what they've been doing. Yeah. And, and even in between. So what's really novel about 2020 in particular, and not just in the United States, but around the world, is that there is it's explicitly conservative social welfare intervention. So it is unambiguously and undoubtedly the case that uh, low income and precarious families in the United States have never received more federal cash ever as quickly as they did in that period. So that's true on the one hand. But it's also true that the coffers of the federal government were opened, especially in the spring 2020, just indiscriminately to any kind of business. So if you like the entire petty bourgeoisie, small business owners were also through the payroll protection program sucked into this scheme. And it, I think it helped that a this was a crisis which, you know, the finger pointing didn't really work that well, though, of course, by the summer, the Republicans were finger pointing at supposedly idle unemployed people who didn't want to go back to work. But in the spring, that 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 didn't work very well. And they had their man in court, their man in the White House. So the usual sort of sniping that you would have received from the GOP is silence. And instead, it's really just this you know, free for all. And you see this even in Europe, where there are, in fact, much tighter rules on the kind of subsidies that can be provided to business, not because Europe isn't a capitalist state structure, but because they police that capitalist state structure differently. But in the in both cases, it was really just a, a free for all, because the aim of the game, despite, as it were, the revolutionary means that are being used to stabilize the system, the aim of the game is explicitly conservative. It's literally, can we put everyone back where we were before this shock happened. And if not, you know, can we maybe even put them in a slightly better position than they were in before this shock happened? Because of course the gamesmanship, the kind of competitive action that you were talking about in the segment before plays out even in these crises. It strikes me hearing all this that um, we're just in an era of such a demassification of, of politics and just uh, democratic accountability, like these decisions get made and we have no say in them at all. We're yapping all day on Jacobin and we, and we have no, no say in the matter. It just like, I mean, this is like a kind of a feature of, uh, the neoliberal era, uh, the end of history, whatever you want to call it. Um, do you foresee that continuing for the foreseeable future or, um, or is, is the pandemic opening up space for, mass politics or democratic accountability, whatever we want to call it, to return and actually have some say in the matter? But this is a key point. I mean, I think the short answer to your question is that remains to be seen and it has to be played out and it is a matter of politics. But the, your starting point, I think, is, is absolutely spot on. One of the reasons why this essentially conservative policy could take on the gigantic dimensions that it did and could, as it were, lead some people to suggest that this was really a kind of war, World War II style Keynesianism or something like that, is precisely that there was no risk. There is no political risk. The reason why neoliberalism in the 70s and 80s in its campaigning phase insisted on, say, the independence of central banks was that they had something to fear from democracy. They had something to fear from the organized forces of trade unions and, and uh, the working class. That is evidently no longer the world that we're in. And the, the ironic effect of that is that it opens up the managers of crises in the centers of power, like the central banks, to do whatever they think is necessary. Famously, the phrase that hangs over all of this is the phrase used by the famous Italian or European central banker Mario Draghi in 2012, where he said, we'll do whatever it takes. And the people he's looking at at the time are a bunch of London hedge funders who are skeptical about the euro, and he's trying to intimidate them. So he says, we'll do whatever it takes, dramatic pause, believe me, it will be enough. So don't bet against the Fed, don't bet against the European Central Bank. That's very much the mood. But the audience there are hedge funders, not trade unionists. If there were, if there was a mass organization, I think one of the, uh, 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 the, one of the questions would be, what would be the limits then of capitalist crisis management? So there's actually kind of a quite complicated balance of, of advantage here to be worked through. And this isn't a surprise. I mean, this has been a classic feature of capitalist crisis management ever since the 20th century when it began in earnest, is as it were, what is the interplay between the technocrats who try and keep the wheels on the bus and social forces, parliamentary or extra parliamentary social forces that configure the force field in which they operate 
And the moment we're in anyone anyway is one of almost complete disinhibition because you know the risks to their action are so slight. You know, you caution against uh, anyone who might be giddy at the thought of, you know, the neoliberal era collapsing uh, because mm -hmm. of, you know, the what could happen uh, to substitute uh, neoliberalism. Can you discuss that and elaborate on on what the potential uh, negative impact of neoliberal neoliberalism collapsing could be, especially with the left in the United States, at least being as powerless as it is at the moment. Well, what goes with the collapse of neoliberalism is neoliberalism's sort of prim, slightly polite edge. And this is frankly not very pronounced in the United States, even at the best of times. It's it's rather more so in, in Europe. Um, but I think that is the worry, right, is that whilst neoliberalism was in a mode of, as it were, trying to define clearly organic bounds for itself and limits, there was a, a shape to it. And we have a vested interest, I think, as, as relatively powerless people in that shape, because those shapes are the laws of the land, commonly recognized rights. And you only have to look at situations where that breaks down, say, Russia in the period after the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, where you see power and violence naked uh, and, and bleeding in tooth and claw deployed for the possession of resources to see how dangerous it can be. As a historian who worked previously on the history of Nazi Germany, I'm forever haunted by the analysis of Nazi Germany offered by the Frankfurt School legal theorists who describe fascism not in its movement phase, but as a regime, as an expression of the collapse of the coherence of the liberal rule of law. And instead, what we end up with is a sort of direct, unmediated relationship between power and money and capital. Now, some people have been tempted to say, OK, so we're headed back towards feudalism. I don't think that's, to my mind, a very convincing way of thinking about this. But we are certainly in a space in which everything is to be played for there. And it could be tilted, if you think about the force of the antitrust agenda now, it could be tilted in quite a progressive direction. And you know, you only have to look to China to see how a regime that isn't afraid of knocking heads together, how it can change the balance of force between a powerful regime willing to use the violence, the coercive power of the state against money, how dramatic the consequences can be, at least in the short run. Um, and I think those are the questions which are up for grabs at this particular moment. Um, but broadly speaking, what we are definitely seeing is a sort of increasing incoherence in the ability of law, general forms of regulation to grasp what's going on, either cross-sectionally at any given moment or in time, across time, which is why we see this more and more ad hoc, more and more aggressive, oversized, sort of headless chicken style interventions by the central banks. You mentioned China's um, state power against money. I found it very funny that the Financial Times uh, reacted to it by uh, saying that they were returning to Maoism. Um, and I was like, I just, I just found that pretty funny. <laughs> like this doesn't. I lived in China. It couldn't be less Maoist. Uh, but uh, I, 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 my question is, is about China and about you know, you, you, you mentioned briefly the, this, this, this kind of move that they're doing lately to. Um, to confront some of the power of of of, of money, business, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, the reactions here in the West to that, but also broadly speaking, just the 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 inevitable, the seeming inevitability of of the overtaking of China of the United States in terms of uh, economic power uh, and and what that'll mean, what that'll mean for the world. Yeah, I think it's really helpful here to separate out different ways of thinking about the economy. I mean, in general, we are indeed in a phase of transition and we are struggling to map it. And it's not just analysts or just interested folks. It's people in the Pentagon are trying to map it. So people with, with power. And I think it's useful to distinguish different metrics. There's the GDP story, the GNP story. How big is the Chinese economy and when will it thoroughly overtake the United States in the next 10 years or so, somewhat sooner than before? Then there's the question of, as it were, how does the Chinese re regime relate to power concentrations in the hands of individual, let's call them for shorthand purposes, oligarchs, their equivalents of the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Jeff Bezoses of this world. So aggregations of capital in the hands of individuals driven more often than not through platform economies. So that question, 
And then they're also simultaneously playing a very subtle game with Western capital. So in a sense, I think, and I, this is, a, I think, broadly persuasive analysis, that as tension between the United States and Beijing rises, not really any longer on the trade front, but above all on the geopolitical, on the hard power defense industry type front, what you simultaneously see on the Chinese part is a very active pursuit of money. So finance, Wall Street, Connecticut, the hedge funds, the asset managers are being sucked into China at the same time. And what China is dangling in front of them is wealth management, which isn't the same thing as GDP. GDP is the whole economy. Wealth management is the aggregated wealth of the top 10% of the Chinese society, which at this point is a huge pot of money that BlackRock and the big fund managers in the West would love to have a slice of. So there are these different dynamics working all at the same time, whilst, of course, also the Chinese working class is struggling com increasingly competitive relations with new emerging market low-income countries that compete with them in industries like the textiles and the garment sector. So it's an incredibly complex, multidimensional picture, which in some ways is actually opening up what we mean by the economy at all, right? Because on the one hand, it's something that's easily measured in the form of GDP. On the other hand, it's a generator of tech, which is essentially what concerns the soldiers. On the other hand, it's really class wealth, which is what the asset managers are after. And, and these are all different forces at work in the same conjuncture. Can you talk about the United States and its perception of China following the pandemic. Um, you know, you talk a little bit about how we really gave China a bit of a win, uh, the West did, in terms of how much the West failed in its response to COVID uh, relative to how China responded to it. Can you discuss uh, what China did right, what the West did wrong, and whether there are any lessons to learn from it? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's staggering. I mean, if you if you like soccer, it's as though the Chinese shipped two goals in the first half and then the whistle blew, the other side came out, ran down to their own goal and proceeded to spend the next 45 minutes firing the ball into their own net. <laughs> and at some point, the referee said, you know, I think the Chinese won. I mean, it's insane. I mean, if we'd stopped the clock at the end of February, this would have been the most severe shock that the Chinese regime had suffered since the end of the Cultural Revolution. It was a disaster of their public health management system. The only way they could see to contain it was to shut their economy down, which they did with incredible force. I'll say a bit in a second about how they did it. Um, and it caused a huge disruption in China itself. And China is a profoundly unequal society. There was a very fascinating discussion that bubbled up that had to be immediately repressed at the very highest level. Li Keqiang, the prime minister, raised the issue that there are 600 million low-income Chinese, just as in the United States. The whole issue of precariousness, inequality bubbled up in China too. And at that point, as it were, if you'd stopped the clock there, you would have said disaster for Xi Jinping's regime. How on earth could they have failed to get it right? Look at the price they paid for, for how they screwed up. They have now got it under control, but you know, no bygones here. This goes in the books as a huge loss. And then Europe happened, and then the United States happened, and the game completely changed. Latin America and, and now spreading to the rest of Asia as well. China's problem now is that they have virtually no herd immunity because they never really had an epidemic in our sense. Um, how they did it is really interesting because there's so many cliches abounding in the West about the regime in China, which clearly we should make no bones about it, is extremely authoritarian, doesn't respect individual rights in the sense that we understand them, but on the other hand cannot be reduced to a sort of Xi Jinping-centered autocratic top-down dictatorship. It's too big a place to work like that. It's like South America, North America, and Europe all added together. It's far yeah. too vast, right? So the way it actually operates is mid-level and low-level self-mobilization in a kind of almost ecological system. A signal comes from Beijing and then everyone has to react. And what's astonishing is how dramatically China reacted. So the place shut itself down. One of the reasons I don't use the phrase lockdown to title the book is that that doesn't really describe what happened. It shut down, hermetically sealed itself. You know, um, plush new private sector uh, housing developments suddenly discover they have a communist party cell and the housing unit shuts down. Villages shut themselves down, factories do. So it's an extraordinary process to which we simply have no counterpart, right? Because we don't, in our Western societies, have that kind of cellular organization. And the CCP talks about it as precisely that, a kind of decentralized cellular power. And they've quite deliberately engineered it. 
Um, it has its own dynamics, which are quite difficult for them because it can become a runaway process. It's not entirely clear it can be steered, but in a moment like this, it triggered and it really shut the economy quickly, which turned out to be the efficient way of dealing with this. The single thing, I mean, that isn't a transposable lesson. We can't apply that in the West. It's, it's unrealistic. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea that Chinese authoritarianism can spread just defies history. The single thing we have to learn in the West is about China, not, as it were, from China. It's just if something happens in a huge Chinese city, 10 million people, very affluent, international airport connections, and Beijing decides they need to shut Beijing down, then we need to react immediately. Because if it matters to Beijing, which is hundreds of miles away from, from Wuhan, then it definitely matters to New York and London too. And the thing <laughs> yeah. that we were in a kind of fog about was, you know, there's all this talk about Chernobyl. Chernobyl was a tiny town behind the Iron Curtain in the Ukraine, right? That is not Wuhan. Wuhan is a mega 10 million people, very affluent, half of them with rich enough to go home or to go on long distance trips for the holidays, right? So. There's just a fundamental, I, I say in the book, and it was quoted in the New York Times, that, you know, this is a sign of the failure of the global elite to understand the world they have created. It's as though they just, they talk all the time about globalization, they travel around, they jet around, and don't get what this implies. And it implies that if something like that happens in Wuhan, we have immediately to start talking about, track, you know, uh, 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 testing and tracing in every single major airport in the entire world immediately not up three months from now but now and and that sort of alertness this hair trigger thing it, we, is was just completely absent in that moment i have to say like i said i lived in china and i, I the the image that people have in the west certainly in the united states of the average chinese citizen as kind of like a um pliant um mm -hmm. Uh, figure who just like whatever the party says, like we, I'm like I, I found just anecdotally in my experience there that they're far less pliant than yeah. the average American. The average it's American like, respects the party. You have met any Chinese people? It's like, have you actually yeah, ever met any Chinese people? No, Do they yeah. strike you? It's like it's no. such a crazy like. No, I've, I've, I've only ever been there for a week. But in that time, I literally saw people <laughs> get out of their cars and berate policemen that they thought were well, yeah. doing the right thing. It was oh, yeah, yeah. You get arrested oh, yeah. in America, thrown to the ground, have a gun pointed at your head, and you'd be incredibly fortunate you didn't end up dead. <laughs> like, yeah. and it, it's just like, it was it, unreal. Now, this isn't to say that there isn't a massive authoritarian regime. Of course it is. Yeah. But, but it doesn't function through a series of robots. It isn't 1.4 yeah. billion robots, right? This is an absurd yeah. kind of misunderstanding of how that power functions. Yeah. No, it's it oh, totally. I mean, I, I just I think it's completely opposite of what the people here think about the Chinese people. I just it's completely backwards. But um, I guess the last question I think we could wrap on is um, speaking about our institutions, the institutions that uh, govern the world, the institutions that uh, led to a series of crises that we've seen in, in the last few decades. Can they be reformed? The EU, the, the IMF, the central banks, all that stuff. Can they be reformed or or or, or just burn it all down? <laughs> I know you guys like the burn it all down answer. No, no, no. Uh, no. We actually, but, uh, Oscar, Oscar does not like the burn it all down. But, but I mean, like, well, I know that's the temptation, right? And this is the sort of, but, but the alternative is completely implausible, right? The idea that there's going yeah. to be some sort of grand rewrite, the sort of Bretton Woods fantasy, I, I, much as I love and sympathize with the people who articulate this kind of view, I just find it very unpersuasive. So the sort of politics I'm fascinated by and interested in is the sort that works from within this structure to try and make effectual change that pushes us in a better direction. And that definitely needs to call on the full force of extra parliamentary mobilization. There's no question, I think, for instance, that the mass mobilization around climate in the Europe in particular changed the debate in Europe, even in you know, people as deeply conservative and unimaginative as Ursula von der Leyen at the head of the president, you know, of the European Commission gets it. So I think it's some combination of those things, but I don't think we should imagine that there is the prospect of the move to greater stability. I mean, we are in a situation of, 
I mean, you know, folks on the left love Gramsci. They love the interregnum phrase. They love this idea that you know we're between two different powers, and this is a time for morbid symptoms or monsters, depending on your translation. And I, you know, monsters is absolutely right. The, the only quibble I have with that is that it presupposes that there's some new order on the other side of this, right? That after the demise of the old order, a new one will come. And and Gramsci was a bona fide, you know, revolutionary intellectual lingering away his days in Mussolini's jail. So he is entitled to, you know, that vision in a way that it doesn't seem to me we are in any way entitled. Um, we may live in a world of monsters right now, but I don't think that that means that we should anticipate, as it were, some more orderly evolution to come. If you enjoyed this video from Jacobin Weekends, please hit like and subscribe. That way, you'll enjoy all of our backlog, as well as all of our future content, including interviews, live streams, and clips. Thank you.